we need a new definition of quality in America. We want people to have good quality, right? We talked about that over and over and have been for a long time. The existing definition of quality is it was care delivered to a gold standard, right? Not a bad definition. The future definition needs to be was the care needed, useful, and appropriate then was it delivered to a gold standard. Felt that definition, you're gonna eliminate huge numbers of CAT scans. By the way, I don't know if you noticed that chart before, we're doing 250, we're doing about 250% more, more CAT scans than they are in the UK. There's a study done recently that showed that one and a half percent of the new cancer cases in America are caused by excessive use of CAT scans. I'm a pretty healthy person in 2007, as I was, uh, as I was getting ready to leave Walmart, I decided I'd get caught up on some cumulative neglect. So I went down and had a, had a stress test and blah, 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 blah. And my doctor said, we got a, got a squiggle on your EKG. So they sent me down for a thallium stress test baseline, then another thallium stress test. He looked at my, somebody looked at my x-ray and said, you broke your back. I said, yeah, I broke it when I was about 20 years old. I remember it very distinctly. He said, well, we, we it's kind of hard to forget. So he said, we need to send you down for a bone scan. So I went down and had the bone scans, blah, blah. Also, I had, a, I had a hernia repair that I'd been neglecting. I went and had that done. I kind of wish I had later. So one CAT scan, another CAT scan. At the end of the, end of the year, I got out my handy dandy atomic energy pocket guide to radiation exposure. I had more radiation exposure in 2007 than the AEC would recommend for 12 years. So if I don't have another dental, dental x-ray, I've got eight more years to go to catch up. There are people in these hospitals that are having 30 CAT scans on the same operative field in two years. They're gonna get, they're at a very high risk of getting bone cancer, liver cancer, kidney cancer when they're 65 or 70 and nobody's ever gonna know why it was. Now, let me back up to two. The reason the folks in this Pareto group, this outlier group, are misdiagnosed, they have multiple conditions, they're seeing multiple specialists, and they don't coordinate. One specialist is looking at a blocked artery, another specialist is looking at, at, at uh, some arthritis they have, another one's looking at a bad hip. Very few places look at the whole person. We can fix that. New definition of medical ethics. The existing definition is, if something may help somebody, let's do it, right? Not a bad definition. The future definition needs to be this. Let's determine the desired patient outcome and use the safest, least invasive way to get there. That eliminates 60% of heart surgeries in America. It'll eliminate about 30 to 40% of the major, major uh, spine surgery. One of the speakers earlier, I think as Jeff mentioned, a, a clinic that does 5% less, or clinics that will do 30 or 40% less if you're willing to put somebody on a plane. If you can save $100,000 on surgery expenses, why not? It put, surgery costs have gone up a lot relative to plane tickets and hotel rooms. It is possible to find clinics that will do 30 or 40% 30 or less spinal surgery on, on patients get them there, avoid the surgery, get them back. I mentioned this, 5% of the facilities in the U.S. follow both these models. Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, Intermountain. There's more, but those, those three are good examples. We know one thing they all have in common. Doctors are salaried. They don't get paid extra to cut. We talked a lot about wellness incentives. Ever heard the term homo economicus? People behave the way they're incentivized to behave. If a doctor can make three or four thousand dollars for two hours work in an operating room, why not? It's pretty easy to make for that, for that blocked artery look, look pretty big and pretty severe. Or somebody that I like that has, uh, that I mentioned earlier, that has stable angina, diabetic with stable angina, it's pretty good to come up with the rationale to do surgery on them. If you're salaried, you don't do that. By the way, most of the heart surgeons never track patients. They track patients on, at these places for the rest of their lives to make sure that they're doing the right quality of surgery. You don't find heart surgeons out there in the fee-for-service system that ever do that. I've never heard of one, ever heard of one that ever does that. Also, the doctors are accountable. 
if any doctor tried to do what they were doing at, at, at that hospital in Reading, they'd be voted off the farm on the spot. They'd be voted off the island immediately. And that's one of a thousand cases. We, I've shown three examples of a thousand that we've all seen about renegade doctors doing wholesale, doing surgery on people that couldn't possibly benefit from it. And it's going on at a lower level than this all over the country today. There's no reason it has to keep going on going forward. The good news is that spending on this is concentrated in a small number of people today. 30 years ago, the group that spent 80% of the dollars was about 30% of the enrollees. Stop me if I'm repeating this. I visited a very large company last week that 1.2% of the employees are spending 40% of the bucks. If you have 50,000 members in the plan, you only have to deal with 500 people. And you can, you can reduce the total cost of your benefit plan significantly. I did a workup on a company that covered about 50,000 lives recently. If they, if they approach what I'm talking about doing even very modestly, they could cut their hospital and surgical expenses in 12 months by 5 to 10 percent. But that's not the whole story. It's not cutting those expenses per se. It's, it's saving lives, keeping people at work, helping them recover, and giving them good, by giving them good quality care. And this is not about getting bigger discounts for anybody. It's about getting the right care. The best care is the most cost effective. I mean, how cost effective can it be to do a surgery on somebody that doesn't need it? Some examples, transplants. Back in the 80s, when I was working for BP, I started noticing that there were people doing around that were doing questionable, dubious transplants. I cut a deal with Cleveland Clinic because they never, I never saw that they never did a dubious transplant. So I had a whole lot, saved a whole lot of people from having a transplant they didn't need. Did the same thing at Burger King, did the same thing at Walmart. Over the years, I've tracked the people I've sent who've been scheduled to have a transplant at a regional health center. When I sent them to one of these facilities for a workup, guess what percentage of them was that were misdiagnosed and didn't need a transplant? 40%, 40%. Up until about 10 years ago, it was 30%. The rate at which this is occurring is higher now than ever, and it's getting worse by the month. It is getting worse by the month. Bypass talked about Let me give you an example. There's women in the room. You're going to love this. I got called by one of the, uh, somebody at one of the hospitals on this. I said, we're seeing something really odd lately. I said, what's that? They said, well, when, when men have a blocked artery, they get angina, and they have it in the upper left-hand quadrant. Women often have it in the right-hand quadrant or in the middle of their back. Do you women know that? They said, we're seeing an ever-increasing number of women come to our facility for a second opinion on a spinal surgery, when they have a perfectly healthy spine, but they've got a blocked artery. Now, how does that happen? A woman goes to the doctor and says, I'm periodically having severe back pain. The doctor prescribes a muscle relaxant. The muscle relaxant doesn't work. They'll try another one. If that doesn't work, they'll refer them to orthopedic surgeon. Do you know that everybody in America has an abnormal back x-ray? There's nobody who doesn't. And the and doctor will try, try his or her muscle relaxant and send vector towards surgery. Now, what's breaking down here? First off, the primary care doctors are not taking good histories on people. They would say, tell me when your back hurts. Women would say, well, when I get on the treadmill or walk up a flight of stairs or that kind of thing. There's no back condition that that's a symptom for. There's only one condition that's a symptom for, and that's exercise-induced angina. There's no, there's no set of symptoms that that's appropriate for. They don't do that. I talked to orthopedic surgeons. They said, well, we don't ask those questions. Why should we? If, they had, if one had a bad part, the doc, primary care doctor should have sent them to a heart surgeon, not to me. If either one of them did an enzyme study to see if there was heart damage, they'd diagnose it immediately, but they don't do that. Places I send people to, any woman shows up there with the back problem is going to get an enzyme study to make sure it's not a heart problem. So what have you accomplished? You can, do a, you can put a 10 pounds of Medtronic's medical uh, steel on their back. Procedure may cost 90,000, plan may allow 60. 
if the woman survives the stress of that with a bad heart, it's a very high risk thing to do, they're still gonna be left with a back problem and a blocked artery. Why not do it right the first time? This kind of micromanagement of the, of the outlier group, the Pareto group, saves money, it saves lives. What to look for in these opportunities, highest ethical standards, excellent quality, best outcomes, lowest net cost. Centers of excellence, what, what we're doing is, we're, what, what you can do, the employers can do, is take a very small number of very lead hospitals and send your folks to them. And it'll be much tighter network than the typical insurance company center of excellence. <coughs> There's, there's complicated reasons. Some of, the, some of the insurance companies I've talked to know about what I'm talking about, but for, their, for a variety of reasons, they have to have very broad networks with, with facilities spaced all over the country. If anybody who's from an insurance company disagrees with me, please, be, please have at it. But there are a very small number that you would, if you knew all the information I knew, you'd want to send your people to. Again, it's less about uh, discounts and it's more about avoiding unnecessary surgery and getting diagnoses right. The, they, when I started, I started going out, I started seeing that we, at Walmart, we covered so many people, we had claims from every hospital and every doctor in America, and I was seeing these gross variations. I went out and visited the good guys, found out what they had in common. Again, physicians are salaried, follow the incentives. They're held accountable. They're, the doctors at the places that were on that list, the doctors, are evaluated on the best patient outcomes. 95% of the doctors operating in freestanding hospitals are evaluated on how many surgeries they do there. How many patients, what the patient volume is. Very, very different models, very different models. I was showing this to an executive VP of a, of a, of HR for a company, he looked at his benefit person and said, I want you to, going forward, I want you to know the names of the 500 top spenders in our company. Mentioned what it says, 30% surgeries, 40% transplants, a huge number of orthopedic surgery that people are misdiagnosed. I've had cases that have been told to have a double knee replacement, and they don't need a double knee replacement. They may need knee surgery, but they don't need a replacement. They need a repair. Going forward, success in this whole area hinges on managing that Pareto group. It's that Pareto group of outliers, all the cost growth is coming from. It's not coming from doctors raising their prices on maternity or, or hernia repairs or appendectomies. It's coming from this group. I mentioned a ventricular assist device. 10 years ago, I was seeing people getting a ventricular assist device, 21 days in the hospital, a fee of about 500,000. Last one I saw was four days for 800,000. The, the, the lady from uh, Highmark mentioned one hospital wants to raise rates 40%. The cost of these things is doubling in 10 years. The folks running corporate benefit plans are the only ones in America that can stop this. You can absolutely call a complete halt to this for 80% of your claim dollars. You have to have an early detection method. Companies are doing it. Has anybody followed the thing Lowe's is doing? They set up programs in their heart cases to, to the Cleveland Clinic and they're having smashing success with it. If Lowe's can do it in a retail environment, any, any company can do it. To identify them, they make arrangements, get them there, get them back. Huge number of people misdiagnosed, huge number of people, they may get a procedure, but it's not the one that some doctor in, in Bug Tussle, Oklahoma told them they need to have. There's also other areas of massive misdiagnosis in childhood and adult neurological diseases. I visited a, a child's, a, a center that specialized in childhood epilepsy they said about 30% of people that come there have been completely misdiagnosed locally. They have a neurological disease, but it's not epilepsy, and they're, getting, they're, they're never going to improve because they're being given the wrong treatment. We don't have to put up with this. The time for that's over. Somebody mentioned earlier that the economy 
if there's ever time to act on this, it's today.